Okay, it's been a few weeks since we last visited the two prophets, Elijah and Elisha. Remember? <laughs> We're interested in them because they give us insights into what we call the, the path of discipleship, the places a disciple must go in their lives, in the, in the process of becoming a disciple. So we stayed on that topic of, of the development of a disciple, but we kind of diverted from the Elijah and Elisha story, and we followed a thread in the writings of, of the Apostle Paul. And he gives us insight into the heart of a disciple. So you see the difference on this whole thing? Uh, Paul gives us insight into the uh, heart of a world-class disciple of Jesus Christ, and Elisha gives us insight into the major places a disciple must visit, the benchmarks a disciple must deal with. Paul helps us see how a disciple processes things in his heart, and Elisha shows us what things a disciple must process. So, having worked through Paul's insights for the past four weeks, we now return to the original story, the story of Elijah and Elisha. And now it's found in 2 Kings chapter 2. Now here we see a step-by-step -step instruction given to the would-be disciple named Elisha, and it's an answer to his quest to be a disciple of such magnitude so as to have a double anointing of the Holy Spirit, more so than that of his mentor Elijah. Well, in answer to his quest, his mentor Elijah invites Elisha to go on a four-city tour with him, or four locations. The last one isn't really a city. Actually, when you read the story, you realize it was really the Lord who sends them on this tour. And I'm going to read the story. In fact, I'm going to read all 14 verses in a bit. But first, I just need to emphasize that the Lord is inviting Elisha to visit four specific locations if he's to expect to receive uh, a double anointing as he's requesting. Now that begs the question, why? <laughs> what do four towns in ancient Israel have to do with being a spirit-filled disciple? Good question. These four towns have meaning, lots of meaning. That is not unique to these locations only. If I were to say to you, let's visit uh, Ground Zero in New York, you'd immediately not only be flushed with the the history of Ground Zero, but with the associated emotions surrounding 9-11. And the same applies to locations with shared meanings, uh, Disneyland, certain battlefields, Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian, or maybe personally to an old treehouse or a gravesite or a location on the highway which marks the place of that fatal accident. Locations have meanings. And these four towns have a lot of meaning. Now, I don't have to read into this or spiritualize it. All I have to do is see what is said about all those towns in the Bible and then let the Bible speak for itself. Now, furthermore, I only want to see what was known about those cities before the time of Elisha's visit, right? Because obviously what happened afterward was not a part of his consciousness. So let's turn to the scriptures. So 2 Kings chapter 2, 1 through 14. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal, the first city. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down together, is the idea. They went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elijah and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Of course, these guys show up everywhere. They're spectators. Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me. See, it's the Lord. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as he did before, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. And again, spectators are there, even though they're prophets. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. This is the Jordan River. And he replied, 
as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So two of them walked on. And again, 50 men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance. See, the spectators are always at a distance watching. They were facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. And Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and he struck the water with it. And the water divided it to the right and to the left. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? And of course, this is where he voices it again. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Man, I want that. Elisha replied, you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, not. As they were walking along and talking, I'd love to have been in that conversation, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and it separated the two of them and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind and Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took his own, hold of his own clothes and tore them apart and he picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elisha. This is the prophetic mantle. And he went back and he stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took that cloak that had fallen from him and he struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he had struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left. Then he crossed over. <laughs> oh man, what a, what, a, what a story. What a colorful story. So let's, let's take a quick review of what we've learned at the first two towns, okay? They started at Gilgal, and then they traveled to Bethel. Gilgal, as Elisha would have known it, consistently speaks of new beginnings and leaving the old behind. Uh, I spent a significant, a significant amount of time studying and researching and developing this teaching associated with the town of Gilgal. And I'd ask you to refer to my sermon that's entitled The Pathway to Spiritual Power. It was given on January 12th. Look at that for the details on Gilgal. We also study the meaning of the town of Bethel, which was the second of the, of the, Holy, the towns the Holy Spirit led them to. Man, very, very powerful. Bethel, as Elisha would have known it, consistently speaks of a heart of wholehearted devotion to God. Catch that. Now, again, I presented the fully researched sermon and its conclusions in my sermon preached on February 2nd, and it's called Bethel, the place of wholehearted devotion. I'd love you, and if you have the time, I'd highly recommend that you view those two messages on YouTube uh, to get to the backstory of where we are up to this point. So we learned so far then that the Holy Spirit leads a person who wants to be a world-class disciple to consider, number one, counting the cost and making a choice to leave the old behind and begin a new serious discipleship walk, to actually do it. You'll never amount to much of a disciple if you just think about it or read about it or frankly pray about it. You do it with prayer. <laughs> Let it happen. Work it out. We see this from the story. You must begin where you are and then start a purposeful discipleship journey and you must settle the issue also of your relationship with God in this. Like Abraham, Jacob and the great patriarchs and disciples throughout history, the disciple must develop his or her heart of devotion, wholehearted devotion to their God. Frankly, Jericho was not known for a certain theme that's carried throughout scriptures such as Gilgal and Bethel. Jericho was known for one thing, and basically everybody knows that one thing. Whether you live in the time of Elisha or today, Jericho is the town where the walls came a-tumbling down. The first town captured by the children of Israel as they entered into the Promised Land. Now, it was not an easy thing either, because the Bible says it was a, a fortress, a locked fortress. Joshua 6, 1 says, now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. And, and you know the story. The Lord told them that they would miraculously take the city if they followed his simple but rather ridiculous instructions. 
And the whole issue of Jericho is obedience, radical obedience to the revealed will of God. And not a lot of common sense being demonstrated when you read the biblical episode of Jericho. Just radical obedience is what you see there. Without a doubt, when Elisha overlooked the now rebuilt city of Jericho, he was reminded of the radical obedience that was exhibited by God's people when they faced the walled fortress several decades earlier. Now understand, this was unprecedented. Quietly marching around the city seven days and shouting on the last day. It's a battle plan that had, had never been done before and had never been asked of anyone to do it. <laughs> kind of crazy. Definitely dangerous. Something one could easily call nonsense. So much like Gideon under God's directive, reducing his massive army to 300 soldiers, being outnumbered, how, how many to one, I don't know, or, or like David, the shepherd boy, running toward the mighty military soldier, the giant Goliath, with a sling and a few stones. Radical obedience to God's revealed will. Jericho's are tough. The idea is clear, of course. Elijah saw it. If you have a heart to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll have to visit Jericho. In other words, you'll have to address the fact somewhere, at some time or other, in your discipleship journey, in your discipleship life, you will be asked to obey God. You will be asked for radical obedience. Now listen, you can count on that. I'm not saying that it is a daily fare of the disciple any more than Joshua was required to do similar radically obedient things every day. But just as the Holy Spirit led Elisha to the outskirts of this historic city, you too, if you want to be a success as a disciple of Jesus Christ, will be asked for an equal measure of radical obedience. You can count on that. It's hard looking this direction when I should be looking that direction. But let's continue. God could have led Elijah and Elisha to any number of locations, but he specifically led them on this tour. Gilgal, Bethel, and now they're standing in front of Jericho. So will you. So if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and really, why would I make it sound as if you have a choice in the matter. After all, you and I are called by Christ to be disciples. In a sense, there's really no choice in the matter. Let me put it this way. When we stand before God at the Bema Seat judgment, we will be judged or measured, if you will, with the yardstick of discipleship. The problem is that many Christians feel there is a choice in this matter, as if there are two callings a calling to be a Christian, and then for those more serious, a calling to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. In no place in the entire New Testament does God even hint at calling us to be Christians. But dozens of times he tells us how Christians should live as disciples. So there's no reason to complicate this. Radical faith is complicated enough because it makes no sense. Unlike Bethel, where, where your goal is to maintain a wholehearted relationship and devotion to God, I know of no disciple of the Lord who lives in Jericho mode, but there's no such thing as a disciple who isn't asked to visit Jericho. So now for a few minutes, I'm going to apply what we're learning to a couple of biblical characters. And this will, I believe, help uh, take this from the theoretical and bring it to the more practical and applicable. After all, if discipleship is nothing else, it is applicable. It is something you do. So, on your screen, you see all three locations uh, we visited up to this point. Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho. Now, Gilgal, again, the place of beginnings, new beginnings, and new commitments, leaving the old ways behind. The old have ceased, and the new has begun. A new beginning and a new commitment, okay. Bethel uh, is the place of wholehearted devotion, pursuing God with your whole heart, with your whole being, and Jericho, 
day study is the place of radical obedience to the known will of God. So let's take Abraham as our, our disciple. Did Abraham experience a Gilgal? Sure enough, <laughs> Abraham certainly faced a precise moment in time which you could call Gilgal, the place of beginning, the place of commitment and leaving the other behind. And without a doubt, it was when his life was interrupted by God while he was living in the heathen city of Ur of the Chaldees. And God said, leave this city, leave your family, and go to a place where I will show you. Yes, leave your family behind. Abraham did it. That's definitely a place of beginning and clearly a place of commitment and leaving the old behind. So leaving Ur of the Chaldees and going to a place that God would one day show him was clearly Abraham's Gilgal. Now, what about Abraham's uh, Bethel? You remember the place of wholehearted devotion to the Lord? Well, we're fortunate here. Abraham's Bethel was Bethel itself. In fact, it was Abraham's actions at Bethel that gave us the understanding of what Bethel means to our prophets today. Elijah and Elisha knew what Bethel meant. When God finally directed Abraham to continue his long journey, now from Haran, a temporary holding place, and to go to Canaan, to the land which God was calling him to and revealing to him, Abraham obeyed God and he entered into his new land. And as soon as he entered into Canaan, he built an altar to the Lord. Know this, he returned over and over and over again to that altar at Bethel, the house of God, it means, as did other Old Testament saints. Abraham's heart of devotion was reaching out to God, and Bethel was the place that it happened. So, more on Abraham. Where was his Jericho? Where was he asked to do a ridiculously crazy, radical action, faith step in his life? And you, you got it already. Abraham's Jericho was when God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him on the mount where I will show you. Whew. Abraham was a disciple for sure. And like those in our study, Abraham definitely visited Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho. Let's do another one. We got a little bit more time. So how about a New Testament disciple? Now, let's look at the Apostle Paul. Now, here are the three locations again. Gilgal, the place of new beginnings and new commitments and leaving the old behind and moving forward in absolute commitment. Bethel, again place of total heart devotion, wholehearted devotion and worship to God. And Jericho, a place of absolute radical obedience. Well, Paul's Gilgal was on the road to Damascus. He was struck to the ground by the blinding light of the presence of God. And through that process, the Lord spoke to him and he committed his life to Jesus Christ. It was the beginning of something new and the ending definitely of something old. And, but it was more than just simply a decision to become a Christian, as I've already mentioned earlier. It was more than a conversion. His only response was, what will you want me to do, Lord? And thus was launched the life of the man who was committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And he taught about that Lordship until he gave his own life as a martyr many years later. Wow. What about Paul's Bethel? Well, it's, it's actually difficult to choose just one, and that should be true of all of us. The fact that he went to the desert in Arabia for three years to seek God is a pretty good indication that he had a heart after God. And we still preach from his epistles, which record his heart, his devotion, his worship for the Lord. No doubt, Paul visited Bethel, and I would suggest Paul visited there often. So what about Jericho? That place of disciple visits when he or she is asked to obey the Lord in some kind of a radical and almost careless uh, manner, trusting in him for the outcome. You guys, no one in their right mind would subject themselves to the torture, the starvation, the persecution, the shipwrecks, the imprisonment, the threats, the beatings that Paul did if it weren't that he were radically obedient to the one whom he was called. Yes, Paul, like Abraham, follows the pattern of discipleship, Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho. Uh, let's do Joshua himself, the guy who's actually faced Jericho, the guy who uh, the original story of Jericho is all about. Let's, let's do him. Did Joshua have a Gilgal, a place of beginning? Yeah, and it, he's first mentioned in the book of Exodus. He was not a, a major 
player prior to this. But one day, the migrating Jewish people coming from Egypt, this massive group of shepherds came under the attack of the Amalekites, a nation trained for war. And you ask, why did you call them shepherds? Well, I thought they were children of Israel. Yeah, but they have been in Egypt now for 400 years. That's a long time. And they've been serving as shepherds, generation after generation after generation of shepherds, not warriors. In fact, never having fought a battle, they lived in Egypt as shepherds. And of course, near the end, as slaves building the pyramids. And now, in, in the midst of their wilderness wanderings, the shepherds come under attack by a military group. And Joshua is asked to, as it were, visit Gilgal, a place of beginnings, a place of new commitments. And he led the shepherds of Israel into war against the raging armies of Amalek. I, I won't get into the whole story, but suffice it to say, Joshua led the Israelites to victory. And this place of beginnings was the threshold of a brand new commitment. For from that point on, Joshua became the military leader for Israel. Did Joshua have a Bethel, a place of heart devotion, dedication, and worship? Yep. For one, when Moses was called upon Mount Sinai to stand in the presence of God, the Bible says, and I quote here, Then Moses set out with Joshua, his aide, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. Now, I imagine that that experience had a lot of influence on Joshua's spiritual growth and his heart development. But there, there's really a better picture of Joshua's Bethel. Listen as I read it from Exodus 33. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp, some distance away, and he called it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching, and watching Moses until he entered the tent. And as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. And whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance to their own tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And then Moses would return to the camp. But his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Wow, heart being touched. Joshua was proving to be a disciple. He had a start and a commitment. He had a heart after God and, of course, Joshua had a Jericho because it was him. <laughs> it was his ridiculous and insane order and quietly march around and well, you, you know the story. What about you? Let me put the towns on the screen again and ask the question, have you been to Gilgal? Have you had a place of absolute, resolute decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ now and forever? Make him the Lord of your life, the place of leaving your past behind and starting brand new, a journey with a new heart. And what about Bethel? Have you built an altar to God? Have you been to Bethel? Do you visit Bethel often, the place where that new heart is fed and nourished and in the presence of God, like Joshua in the tent? The place visited over and over, like Jesus himself, getting up early in the morning and going to a place alone to be with his Father. Have you been to Bethel? Do you go often to Bethel? Do you need to do like Abraham did after wandering around Egypt? Do you need to return to Bethel and rebuild that altar? And of course, there's Jericho. You don't live every day in Jericho like you, you should live in Bethel, but you will visit there if you haven't already, that place of radical trust and obedience. Maybe this message is timely for you. Maybe you're looking at your Jericho today. You can have a radical obedience because frankly, you have a radical God. He doesn't often do the same thing the same way, but he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Whether you're fighting a fighting shepherd under God's protection, or whether you're an attacking boy with a sling, or you're asked to sacrifice your dearest possession, or marching quietly around the walls of Jericho, know this, every disciple goes to Jericho, but 
just outside the walls, he meets the commander of the Lord's host. You are never alone. God bless you.